Hello again, and welcome to Aviation News Talk, a weekly show with relevant news and flying tips for pilots and student pilots to help keep you safe. I'm Max Ruscott. For our main topic today, we're going to be talking about instrument flying gotchas, those subtle little details that are easily forgotten and can get you in trouble. Plus, I'll talk about my recent six-day trip teaching in the Cirrus Vision Jet, and we have listener questions about getting the IFR routing you want and what to do when ATC dumps you while you're still in a class Charlie. Last week in episode 166, we talked with Steve Bush, owner of Lone Star Helicopters, about how to get a helicopter certificate. So if you didn't hear it, you may want to check it out. And if Aviation News Talk podcast is new to you, well, in whatever app you're listening to us now, just click on the subscribe button so new episodes will download for free each week. I think you'll enjoy our discussion today about IFR gotchas, and you won't want to miss future shows. This week in the news, the Null Report shows a drop in GA accident rates. And there are conflicting stories about how easy it might be to catch COVID on an airline flight. And a pilot is sentenced after pleading guilty to attempting to operate an aircraft under the influence of alcohol. All this and more, and the news starts now. From avweb.com, the Null Report shows a drop in accident rates. AOPA and the Air Safety Institute have launched a new platform designed to provide access to more current accident data in near real time. According to AOPA, the new platform will allow accident data to be updated on a rolling 30-day cycle. It will also let users select and compare accident analysis graphs for multiple years from 2008 through 2020. ASI Senior VP Richard McSpadden said, I'm excited that this major effort has significantly accelerated the accident analysis process. This allows us to release the 29th and 30th Joseph T. Null reports, which provide a snapshot in time for 2017 and 2018 data, respectively. Digging into that data, the 29th Null report found that the total number of GA accidents in 2017 decreased from 1,227 in 2016 to 1,204. The 2017 analysis also saw an improvement on 2016's overall accident rate of 4.98 accidents per 100,000 hours, coming in at 4.8 accidents per 100,000 hours. The 2017 fatal accident rate also dropped slightly from 0.78 per 100,000 hours the previous year to 0.76 per 100,000 hours. The 30th edition of the report, covering 2018 data, noted an increase in total accidents to 1,224. However, it found a further drop in the total accident rate to 4.56 per 100,000 hours, as well as a decrease in the fatal accident rate to 0.74 per 100,000 hours. Landing accidents, of which there were 335 in 2016, dropped to 314 the following year, but rose to 322 in 2018. Weather-related accidents spiked from 23, including 12 fatals in 2016, to 42, including 32 fatals in 2017, though there was a decrease in 2018 back down to 23 accidents and 21 fatal weather-related accidents. In all three years, the majority of those accidents involved VFR flight into IMC. The NAL report analyzes aviation accident data from years where probable causes have been determined for at least 80% of the accidents that occurred. And to make it easier for you to read the null reports, I've included links to them in our show notes. And here are several quick stories about COVID on the airlines. And of course, I'm quite interested in this, having done three airline trips here in the last five weeks. This comes from federalnewsnetwork.com. It says DOD, that's Department of Defense study, says it's hard to contract COVID-19 on an airplane. DOD's in-air and on-ground testing indicate commercial aircraft present low risk for COVID transmission. In the midst of the pandemic, all available evidence shows it's a very good idea to keep oneself away from large gatherings of other people and to avoid unnecessary travel. But if you really need to go somewhere, it's extraordinarily unlikely you'll contract the virus during a plane flight, they say. That's according to a just-finished study by the U.S. Transportation Command and DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, which officials say is the largest study of airborne particles in airplanes that have been conducted. Defense officials launched the research to help determine the risk of moving service members and their families aboard contracted commercial aircraft, most commonly the Boeing 777 and 767 jets, which have been collectively dubbed the Patriot Express. The test estimated you'd need to be sitting in the same plane with a COVID-infected passenger for 54 straight hours before you inhaled enough viral particles 
to become infected. But there's a flip side to that. Here's a story that comes from Yahoo.com. It says the airlines insist flying is safe, but nearly 100 U.S. air marshals have been infected with COVID-19. Last week, they say a number of COVID-19 cases hit the Federal Air Marshal's Dallas office and shuttered its field office in Philadelphia. And earlier in October, an air marshal based in Minneapolis died from COVID-19. Several air marshals told Yahoo News the deceased officer believed he had contracted the virus on a flight. The TSA told Yahoo News that 98 Federal Air Marshals have tested positive for the COVID-19 virus, though it does not address whether those cases were from flying. Yet some air marshals, who are armed law enforcement officers who protect civil aircraft from attacks, directly linked at least some of those infections to their time spent in airports and on flights. Both associations that represent many of the nearly 3,000 federal air marshals also believe that at least some of their members contracted the coronavirus from their work on flights, so they acknowledge some of these cases were from the start of the pandemic prior to the nationwide shutdown or the introduction of masks on flights. The Air Marshal Association knows of one federal air marshal case at the start of the outbreak that is linked with certainty to a European flight, said John Cassaretti, president of the association, which represents about half the air marshals. While air travel is at a historic low, federal air marshals are still flying on aircraft to protect them from terrorist attacks, a job that now comes with a new set of risks amid a pandemic. The recent death of an air marshal and other recent cases come at a time when airlines are Desperate to convince the public that flying is safe, emphasizing their ventilation systems, disinfectant procedures, and mandatory mask requirements. And here's a story from CNN.com. A Dallas area woman died due to COVID-19 while on a flight from Las Vegas, according to county officials. The woman was in her 30s and had underlying high-risk health conditions, Dallas County said in a news release. Now, it's interesting. This story just came out in October, but it was about a flight that occurred in July, specifically on Spirit Airlines on July 24th. They say that when she became unresponsive, that the plane was diverted to Albuquerque. The proper authorities responded, and it was determined that the individual was deceased on arrival. The news comes as people appear to be getting more comfortable flying during the pandemic. The TSA screened more than 1 million passengers, according to the agency, the most since March 16th. And I can just tell you from my personal experiences of taking airline flights over the last five weeks, uh, three different trips, I still feel relatively safe on the airlines, but I'm pretty, pretty diligent about keeping my mask on at all times. Where I think I encounter the greatest risk is when I have to eat at restaurants. And so I always, always, always get takeout food when I'm on these trips. From MyMotherLoad.com, Columbia Air Base to get a state-of-the-art helicopter. Still using a helicopter from the Vietnam era, Cal Fire Columbia Air Attack Base will be one of a dozen bases statewide to get a new high-tech Firehawk. Cal Fire spokesperson Scott McLean confirmed that statewide 12 Huey helicopters will be switched out for new Lockheed Martin Sikorsky S-70I Firehawks. Each of the new helicopters costs $25 million for a total price tag of $325 million. McLean affirmed, we hope to see our first Sikorsky in Sacramento in about a month or so and start training and testing it. He added, we'll start seeing the balance of them trickling in over the next three, three and a half years or so. I don't have a time frame for when Columbia will get theirs. The new bird is a significant improvement, touts McLean, who details, quote, these helicopters will come with tanks, not buckets. The buckets on our old Hueys would hold about 360 gallons. The Korskis will carry about 1,000 gallons, have more power, and fly faster. He explains that with the tanks being more than double in size, it will allow crews to fight the flames longer in those important first minutes on the scene and during the duration of the blaze. Besides the tank, the actual helicopter is also much larger. Quote, it gives us better capability, some of which will be set up for night flying. We'll have the latest technology in these aircraft. It enhances our responses to various incidents, especially to Alamy and Calaveras counties, considering the topography. And now they're both fairly mountainous counties. McLean revealed other upgrades being made to Cal Fire's air fleet, noting that seven new C-130 four-prop engine planes with 4,000-gallon tanks will start arriving in Sacramento about mid-year 2021. McLean also relays that all of the state's air bases are strategically placed, with each having no longer than a 20-minute response to any incident, a strategy that appears to be working as he boasts. He says we're, quote, keeping 95% of our wildfires at 10 acres or less, And that's through a combination of aircraft, dozers, and ground crews. 
From SFVBJ.com, record flight for electric airplane at Camarillo Airport. A hybrid electric-powered aircraft developed by Ampere and launched from Camarillo Airport completed their longest flight to date for an airplane employing electric propulsion. The recent flight, piloted by Justin Gillen and Russell Newman, who, by the way, is a Patreon supporter of ours, took off from Camarillo and landed two and a half hours later at Hayward Airport in the San Francisco area after flying up the Central Valley at 8,500 feet. The pair flew the Electric Eel, a six-seat Cessna 337 twin-engine aircraft modified with an electric motor in the nose and a combustion engine in the rear. The milestone electric aviation took place after four weeks of flight testing in the Camarillo area. In that time, the aircraft flew more than 30 hours during 23 flights in 28 days, according to the Hawthorne Company. The aircraft will now be partially disassembled for shipment to Hawaii, where it will be used in a series of demonstration flights with an airline there. The electric eel can generate fuel and emission savings of about 30% on longer regional routes, such as the Camarillo to Hayward flight, and savings up to 50% on shorter regional routes, where the aircraft's electrical propulsion system can be run at high power settings. From newatlas.com, an autonomous electric crop duster gets approval for U.S. demos. Although there are now a few different crop spraying multi-copter drones, Fixed-wing drones are faster and have a longer battery range. That's where the recently U.S.-certified autonomous electric Pelican crop duster comes into the picture. Developed by Oakland, California startup Pika, that's P-Y-K-A, the Pelican is claimed to be much cheaper and easier to use than combustion-engine, human-flown, fixed-wing, crop-spraying aircraft. The drone itself has a 20-foot-long and 38-foot wingspan, carries a spray payload of up to 625 pounds, and can take off and land within the space of just 150 feet. Thrust is provided by three 20-kilowatt electric motors, two on the wings and one on the back, delivering a cruise speed of 90 miles per hour. Those motors are powered by a lithium polymer battery pack, a full charge of which is claimed to be good for a flight range of 70 miles. Plans call for the final version of the Pelican to utilize its 3D mapping and path planning systems to establish the location and boundaries of the target field, and to identify obstacles in and around the area. It not only cruises autonomously, but also takes off and lands on its own, reportedly never varying from its pre-programmed path by more than one meter. According to PICA, the Pelican can spray up to 135 acres of land per hour. That figure is based on a spray rate of two U.S. gallons per acre. It includes filling time, turnarounds, and battery swaps. One of the company's earlier prototype aircraft, the Egret, has already been tested on crops in New Zealand. On October 21st, though, the Pelican was granted a special airworthiness certificate by the FAA. This will allow it to be demonstrated at American farms where crews will be trained in its use. Ultimately, PICA plans on leasing the aircraft to aerial spraying companies. From ArgusPress.com, Garmin announced that it was awarded the 2020 Grand Laureate in the business aviation category by Aviation Week Network for its revolutionary Garmin Autoland, the world's first autonomous safety-enhancing technology for GA aircraft with the ability to land an aircraft without human intervention. In the event of an emergency, the pilot or passengers on board the aircraft can activate Autoland to land the aircraft with a simple press of a button. Autoland can also activate automatically if the system determines it's necessary. Once activated, the system calculates a flight plan to the most suitable airport, avoiding terrain and adverse weather, initiates an approach to the best runway, and automatically lands the aircraft without pilot or passenger intervention. The first Autoland system for GA aircraft, the Garmin Autoland, has received FAA certification in the Piper M600, the TBM940, and the Cirrus Vision Jet as part of the G3000 integrated flight deck. And if you want to hear more about Autoland, you'll want to listen to the interviews I did while visiting Garmin about a year ago on the day they announced Autoland, and you can hear those in episode 128. From generalaviationnews.com, an incorrect altimeter setting results in a CFIT, or controlled flight into terrain. The pilot reported that he entered a left traffic pattern for runway 30 at the airport in Hobbs, New Mexico, during night VMC conditions. Although he thought he had sufficient altitude during the initial phase of the final approach, based on his altimeter indication, shortly after turning to final, the Piper PA-28R hit terrain. The plane sustained substantial damage to the right wing and fuselage, but the three occupants were uninjured. Post-accident examination of the airframe and engine revealed no evidence of pre-accident mechanical failures or malfunctions 
that would have precluded normal operation. The examination did reveal that the altimeter had an incorrect setting, which resulted in an altimeter indication error of plus 800 feet mean sea level. The pilot stated that he must have had the incorrect altimeter setting for the destination airport. Probable cause, the pilot's incorrect altimeter setting during the night visual approach, which resulted in controlled flight into terrain. And I must say this pilot was very lucky. Typically, these kinds of accidents usually are fatal. Now, here's a story about some folks who weren't quite so lucky. This comes from the dailymail.co.uk. Mexican military seizes private jet carrying $72 million worth of cocaine and arrests pilot. Now, it still amazes me that people still try doing this. But anyway, the Mexican military detected a private jet illegally entering its airspace and found a ton and a half of cocaine inside it when it was forced to land at an airport near the border with Belize. President Andreas Manuel Lopez Obrador announced during his daily press briefing that the military arrested one of the two pilots after they abandoned the aircraft at Chituma International Airport in Chituma. The suspect's identity was not revealed to the press. President Obrador said that despite the seizures of the jet, approximately 1 a.m. local time, two other aircraft that were detected in Mexican airspace were out of the armed forces' reach. The massive shipment is worth approximately $72 million in the U.S., It's unknown where the jet had departed from. And it's the second time in three weeks that the Mexican military has intercepted a narco jet. And finally, from KSTP.com, which is a TV station in St. Paul, Minnesota, Delta pilot who was arrested for intoxication, sentenced. A Delta Airlines pilot who was arrested in July 2019 for being intoxicated before his scheduled flight out of the Minneapolis-St. Paul airport was sentenced. According to court records, Gabriel Lyle Schroeder will serve 30 days, the majority of which will be under home detention. He will also be required to spend one weekend in jail. Schroeder will then be placed under probation, which will include alcohol treatment. He pleaded guilty to attempting to operate an aircraft under the influence of alcohol. And by the way, 30 days is a pretty light sentence uh, compared to that which was received by the three Northwest pilots who were convicted in 1990 of flying a Boeing 727 while drunk. Two of those pilots received a one-year sentence, and the third received a 16-month sentence. And I met one of those three pilots about 10 years ago at Air Venture, and he had served his sentence in federal prison, where at one point he was attacked by a cellmate. And I must say, he still looked haunted by the experience when I saw him. And now getting back to the rest of the story, according to the criminal complaint, on July 30th at about 10.30 a.m., airport police and TSA we're conducting a random joint insider threat screening in Terminal 1 in the known crew member entrance. During the detail, a detective observed a Delta pilot, later identified as Schroeder, approached the screening area before he stopped abruptly and appeared surprised. A TSA supervisor approached Schroeder and informed him they were conducting additional screening. He asked Schroeder to place his bag on the table for screening, and Schroeder reportedly told the TSA supervisor that he was not ready to be screened and left the area. Supervisor reported the pilot's suspicious activity to the TSA police due to concern that Schroeder may have had a prohibited item in his bag. After two detectives were unsuccessful in locating the pilot, they placed a request with the airline dispatch to have Schroeder tracked down. When the detectives returned to the screening area, they found the pilot getting screened. An air marshal asked where he had gone, and Schroeder stated he had gone to the Delta crew room to retrieve his iPad that he had allegedly forgotten. According to the complaint, the air marshal said Schroeder appeared to be nervous and deceptive. Dispatch informed one of the detectives that Schroeder had gone to the restrooms located on the tram level for approximately 27 seconds and that he, in fact, did not enter the Delta crew room. The detective and federal air marshals entered the restroom and located an unopened 1.75 liter bottle of Phillips vodka in the trash container. Detectives then made contact with a pilot in the cockpit of an Airbus A321 The complaint states they witnessed the pilot in question seated in the first officer's chair and operating console of the aircraft while conversing with the captain of the aircraft who was seated to Schroeder's left. Detectives noted that there were already two passengers on board. After asking the pilot to speak with them, one of the detectives noticed Schroeder started sweating and shaking. When asked, the pilot said he had last consumed alcohol three days prior. A detective reported he smelled the light odor of a consumed alcoholic beverage on Schroeder's breath. A breath sample was taken, and Schroeder's reading was 0.065 blood alcohol level. He was then placed under arrest and transported. 
And I'm sure you know the moral to this story, which is, for God's sake, don't mix drinking and flying unless you really want to screw up your life. Anyway, uh, having grown up in a family with an alcoholic parent, I hope that uh, Mr. Schroeder gets the treatment that he needs and is able to continue with his career successfully. Well, that's the news for this week. Coming up, my weekly updates. And then we'll get on to our main topic, which is talking about some IFR flying gotchas and a pilot deviation. All right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. And now let's start things off with another fun flying destination. Hi, Max. This is Brett Ross with a fun flying destination. My fun flying destination is Kern Valley Airport, identifier Lima 05. It's an airport in the Southern Sierra Mountains in California. It's a 3,500 foot runway and about a 2,500 foot altitude airport. The pattern is a lot of fun to fly because it's a mountainous area, so you'll have mountains around you. So you got to be a little careful, but it is a really fun, nice view. Once landed at the airport, you can you can eat at the restaurant, and they also camp at the airport as well underneath your airplane. If you want to drive about three miles south with a rental car, you can camp at a lake called Lake Isabella. It's a pretty big lake, and um, you can also go fishing there as well. Also, Kern Valley serves Kernville, and Kernville is home to a, a lot of uh, rivers, and outdoor adventures. And if you're feeling adventurous, you can go whitewater rafting there. So that's my fun flying destination. Thanks. Brett, thank you so much for sending us that fun flying destination. Years ago, I flew my old seaplane down to Lake Isabella. So I know the area there, pretty mountainous and also very pretty. And guess what? That is the last one we have in the queue. So no more fun flying destinations unless you take some initiative to send me one. So it doesn't matter where you are, what state, what country you're in. If there's an airport near you that you like and you want to tell people about it, please do that. It's easy to do. Just pull out your smartphone, look for the Voice Memos app. You can record up to, oh, say about 90 seconds. Tell us all about your favorite airport and then email that file to me at aviationnewstalk at gmail.com. Or if you'd like, just go out to our website of aviationnewstalk.com. Click on Listener Question at the top of the page, which will lead you to our SpeakPipe app, where you can always record anything you'd like, but that's a great way to record a fun flying destination. Now here's an update on some of my flying. A couple of weeks ago, I flew commercially to Knoxville for the third time in five weeks to do some teaching in the Cirrus Vision Jet. That was essentially a six-day trip, as it takes a full day to get out there via the airlines, and I then spent five days flying around the western U.S. to give the pilot 25 hours of SOE, or Supervised Operating Experience. He had just completed the two weeks of training for his vision jet type rating and had passed his check ride. But since that training is all done under Part 142, which means that nearly all the training is done in a simulator, it, and by the way, these simulators are multi-million dollar full motion simulators, since it's done under that type of uh, training, the F-8 requires that after the check ride, a pilot needs to fly in the airplane for 25 hours, while being supervised by a pilot who has a type rating for that aircraft. And there is also a long list of tasks which Cirrus requires us to fit in during those flights. We spent most of that time in the western U.S. as there are plenty of challenging airports and because it was closer to our ultimate destination of Watsonville, California, which is a nice little town right next to the Monterey Bay where the owner is based and where I often hang out on weekends. Now, let me tell you all the airports we landed at, and then I'll tell you about an interesting challenge we encountered at one of those airports. From Knoxville, we flew to Olathe, Kansas, home of Garmin, and from there we went to Centennial Airport in Denver, where we spent the night. The next morning, we flew to Santa Fe, New Mexico. From there, we were planning to go to Eagle County Airport, which is in the Rocky Mountains of Colorado. It has a rather challenging departure procedure that we were looking forward to trying, but the XM weather was showing Possible icing and SLDs, supercooled large droplets, which are the worst form of icing, uh, right over the airport. And since our syllabus called for us to do at least one diversion, I diverted us to Grand Junction, Colorado, which had much better weather. From there, we went to Jackson Hole, Wyoming, which I'll talk about in more detail in a moment. From there, we went to Tacoma Narrows in Washington, and then directly to Montgomery Field in San Diego. Now, that flight took a little over three hours and was great fun, as I had never flown the entire length of the West Coast in a single flight. 
Uh, while we were at Montgomery Field, I spotted Robert De Laurentiis' Citizen of the World airplane, which has now completed a polar circumnavigation. And you may recall that we had Robert on the show about a year ago on episode 119. From San Diego, we then flew to Watsonville, but ended up diverting to Salinas, California. And I'll talk more about that during our main topic when we talk about several IFR-related encounters I've had over the last couple of weeks. The next day, we flew from Salinas to the Grand Canyon Airport in northern Arizona and back. And on the fifth day, we did a night flight to Paso Robles, California and back. So it was all great fun as I just love flying the Vision Jet. But since I was gone for almost a week, I wasn't able to create as many episodes of this podcast as I usually do. So I really thank you for your patience in waiting for this episode. Now, let me tell you about our departure out of Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Jackson Hole is a beautiful little town that's deep in a valley in the mountains of northwestern Wyoming, and it's just south of one of the entrances to Yellowstone National Park. And boy, about 12 years ago, I got stuck there for several days waiting for an aircraft to be repaired, and I just love spending time in that area. When we arrived, it was overcast, so we flew the ILS Zulu Runway 19 approach. There's also an ILS Yankee Runway 19 approach, and the difference is that the minimums on the Zulu approach are lower but to fly the missed approach, you need to have a minimum climb capability of 235 feet per nautical mile to 10,600 feet. Now, that's 235 feet per nautical mile, not 235 feet per minute. So to figure out if you can make that climb gradient, you have to use your aircraft's climb speed to convert from feet per nautical mile to feet per minute. We had picked up a little ice on the wings as we were coming in on the ILS, the airport field elevation is 6,451 feet, and when we landed, it was 9 degrees Celsius, or about 48 Fahrenheit, and it was raining lightly. We originally planned to go to the Eagle County Airport because they have that challenging departure procedure, but Jackson Hole has a somewhat less challenging departure procedure, and we spent probably about 40 minutes discussing it and the climb capabilities of the Cirrus Vision Jet. First, I should mention, if you don't already know, the Cirrus Vision Jet has just one jet engine, and while that makes it very economical to operate as you're burning only half as much jet fuel, the downside is that its climb rate is not as good as other jets, which is what you'd expect. Most of the time, that doesn't matter. I have a few hundred hours of experience in the Vision Jet, and this literally was the first time I've encountered a situation where we had to closely look at the climb rate. In our case, we were looking at the Alpen 2 departure procedure, which requires a climb rate of 341 feet per nautical mile up to 15,000 feet. And when we later got a clearance, it was to cross Kickney, K-I-C-N-E, at 16,000 feet instead of 15,000 feet. So we would have required an even higher climb rate. Fortunately, the Vision Jet AFM, or POH if you will, has many tables in it so you can figure out what kind of climb gradient you can achieve over a wide range of temperatures and altitudes. Unfortunately, the normal table confirmed that we wouldn't be able to achieve the required 341 feet per nautical mile all the way up to 15,000 feet, and certainly not to 16,000 feet. However, there is a separate climb table that achieves a steeper climb gradient if you climb with full power, flaps set for 50%, and at the VX climb speed of 91 knots. Now, that's remarkable, is 91 knots is slower than the climb speed we typically use in a Cirrus SR20 or SR22, but it will give you a much steeper climb gradient than the normal climb out with flaps and climbing out at 160 knots in the Vision Jet. But there are a couple of gotchas. First, that table only goes up to 10,000 feet, so we didn't have any performance data as to what would happen if we tried to continue climbing that way from 10,000 feet up to 15,000 feet. And the table is based upon remaining at full takeoff power for the entire time, yet there's a five minute limitation using the takeoff power. So this is where the pilot needed to do a lot of work to calculate our climb rate using one table for a climb at full power and flaps 50% up to 10,000 feet, and then using a separate table for the climb from 10,000 feet to 15,000 feet with flaps up and maximum continuous thrust, which is less than full takeoff power. The pilot did a great job of constructing a graph showing how much our climb rate would be for every mile we proceeded along the departure procedure. Interestingly, through 10,000 feet, we would greatly exceed the required climb rate, which is good. But then from 10,000 feet through 15,000 feet, we didn't meet the required climb rate. However, since we had exceeded the climb needed in the first half of the climb, 
we would still reach the required altitude and time as we would be eating into the altitude margin that we had built up during the first half of the climb. So the pilot made a very strong and convincing argument that by the numbers, everything should work. I asked him how the light rain might affect our climb, and more importantly, since we had picked up ice in the descent, we should expect to pick up ice in the climb, and how would that affect our climb rate? Of course, there was no way to factor that into the numbers. Clearly, icing would affect our climb, but by an unknown amount. Now, if we had had lots of surplus climb capability, I wouldn't have been concerned, but we didn't. Now, I like to have huge safety margins built into everything I do when I fly, and while this pilot made a convincing argument that probably everything would work out fine, I never want to be in the position where two pilots look at each other and say, well, I guess that didn't work out the way we thought it would. So I asked the pilot if we had any other options, and he immediately came up with the one I was looking for, which was that we could stay overnight because the forecast looked better for the next day. So I spent a lovely evening walking around Jackson Hole and got some nice Thai food, and in the morning, the rain had stopped, and there was a large sliver of sky that was completely blue. So our plan was to climb up in it rather than fly through the clouds on the departure procedure and pick up our IFR clearance after we reached the minimum vectoring altitude. Interestingly, the tower kept offering us other options that I think they were getting from Salt Lake City. One I recall was that instead of crossing a Kinchi at 16,000 feet, they could give us 15,000 feet. I forget what the other option was, but... Climbing up into the blue sky was clearly going to be a better option for us. So after takeoff, we did climb out at full power, flaps 50%, at uh, maximum takeoff power for about three minutes. We climbed at 100 knots instead of 90 knots, since we were going to be in clear skies and didn't need the absolute best climb rate, and because that extra 10 knots added a little safety margin if we were to encounter any wind shear in the mountains. We turned to the north and climbed up in the same valley through which the ILS is aligned. At some point, we contacted Salt Lake Center, and they told us that we needed to reach their 16,000-foot minimum vectoring altitude. Once we did, they cleared us from our present position, which saved us time, versus following the departure procedure, which would have taken us to the south and out of our way during the initial climb. So all in all, it was a good experience in getting the maximum performance out of our aircraft while building an extra safety margin at every step along the way. And I want to thank a number of listeners who've contacted me and told me how much this show helps them with their flying. For example, I just got this message from Richard Benson in Bend, Oregon, who wrote, Greetings, Max. I've truly enjoyed your podcast these last few weeks. And in addition to saying thanks, I'm sending a PayPal donation. I've been flying since 1978 and continue to be impressed by the amount of passion that exists in GA and how freely folks like you and Tom Turner, who's also a Patreon supporter, and many others give of their time for aviation safety and the greater good of all. I also appreciate your sense of humor. Episode 142, in which you did Aviation News of the Weird with Rob Mark, was over the top. Keep up the great work, Max. Your new fan, Richard in Bend, Oregon. Thanks so much, Richard. And Bend is just a lovely town. I have enjoyed my many visits there in the past, visiting what was in the Columbia factory when uh, the Columbia 400 was being built up there. And of course, if you'd like to sign up to support the show, just as Richard has, this would be a great time to do it. You could make a one-time donation like Richard did by going out to aviationnewstalk.com slash PayPal. You can also sign up to do a monthly donation that way. Or you can go to aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome to sign up via Patreon. And when you sign up via Patreon, we have all kinds of goodies that you'll get at different levels of the show. For example, at the $4 a month level, you'll get transcripts for each show. At the $8 a month level, you'll also get links to the many news stories we had to cut out of the show because we didn't have enough time. This week, there were 12 stories that we had to cut from the news. At the $20 a month level, you'll actually get access to some of these shows early. For example, Patreon members got this particular show about a day early. And at the $35 a month level and higher, you'll get access to my online courses on the G1000 and on WAS that I sell at pilotlearning.com. And when you sign up, I'll read your name, which will literally get heard by thousands of listeners in over 140 countries, including Luxembourg, Singapore, and Uruguay. Now let me tell you about some of the great people who have just signed up to support the show. We have two mega supporters. One is Greg Van, who's signed up at the $50 a month level. He's a senior aviation medical examiner at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. He also hosts a podcast focused on aerospace medical issues for pilots, which is called 
Mayo Clinic Clear Approach, which you can find wherever you get your podcast. I've listened to the show and I recommend it. And also we have James Kerr as another $50 a month mega supporter. James is interested in buying an SR22 for business travel. And I'll tell you more about James next time. Other new patrons include David Dismore, Brett Denhart, Nick Reinhart, J.B. Wagner, Mark Finkelstein, and Greg Williams. We also had one-time PayPal donations from Don Kephart for $20 and Richard Benson for $50. And here are the mega supporters we mention on every show. Brian Deere, who lives here in Northern California and recently acquired a Turbo 206. Tyson Weiss, co-founder and CEO of ForeFlight, and I'll be mentioning them briefly uh, in the main topic of our show. Bruce Dickerson, he's a financial planner living in Georgia, and he flies at K35 Bonanza. Victor Vogel, who lives in central PA, flies a Cirrus and is looking to start a flight school. Tim Delaney, he's out of Santa Rosa, California, where he flies an SR-22, and he is a wealth manager. Stephen Elop flies a Turbo 182 and a Cessna Citation CJ3+. He's now the CEO of API Jet. Mike Williams, he's the president of Kiomac and of TCB Composites, maker of composite spinners and bulkheads for GA aircraft, and he flies a Cessna 172. Seth Lake, we've had him on the show. He's a DPE giving check rides in Arkansas, where he also specializes in teaching the multi-engine rating in his Beechcraft Travel Airs. So if you want to get your multi-engine rating or would like to do a check ride, check out vsl.aero. Rick Miller, he's a CFI. He teaches in the Cincinnati area at both the Lunkin Flight Training Center and with private owners of Piper's, Cessna's, Beechcraft, and Cicadas. He says he would still love to teach full-time, but has that day job for a few more years. Justin Winter, he sells real estate on Lake Kiowe in South Carolina, and he flies a 2019 SR-22. Carl and Ann Rossi of Maine Cooncat Aviation. Now, they've just changed their fleet lineup. They used to have three uh, Cessna T240s, and I'll tell you next time about what they currently have. Johnny McDade, who I've met, he's a singer, songwriter, and musician, and record producer. Jim Goldfuss is flying out of the Republic Airport on Long Island. He's training for his CFI and CFII, and meanwhile is teaching ground instruction at the Pilot Proficiency International Flight School. You can reach him through his Facebook page, Ground Point 9, as he's available for individual instruction in person or online. Charlie Mason flies out of Austin, Texas, and he's working on his instrument rating in a Cessna 172. Vincent Salimi, he is council member for the city of Pinal here in Northern California. He also owns Salimi Construction Management in San Francisco. Jim Hopp is a CFI who I've flown with. He teaches at Advantage Aviation at my home airport, Palo Alto. Lars Litgens, he's our youngest supporter. He flies a Redbird simulator, and someday he hopes he can fly his dad's Cessna 205. Dad, by the way, sells boats at boulderboats.com. Joseph Sheehan flew in the Navy for eight years and now has a couple hundred hours in his new Vision Jet. Josiah Freeman, working on his instrument rating in Arizona. Dylan Caldwell, he is a relatively new AME, so he gives flight physicals at the Naples Municipal Airport in Florida. So if you need a basic med, second or third class physical, contact him through aviatorsclinic.com. And William Birch donates to the show in the memory of his son, Lieutenant J.G. Wallace Birch, who was a Navy pilot. Don Hakala is with Professional Instrument Courses. They conduct 10-day instrument courses, IFR finish-up, and IFR refresher courses at iflyifr.com. Steve Bush, we just had him on the show in episode 165. He owns Lone Star Helicopters in Lago Vista, Texas. He does a lot of add-on ratings as well as helicopter ratings at lonestarheli.com. Don Delman is a professional pilot who runs an airline flight department. He's also CFI and flies a Bonanza, and we've been exchanging email recently. Rick Mattis, an owner of PointWise, which makes CFD, that's Computational Fluid Dynamics Simulation Software, used by aerospace companies. You can find them at pointwise.com. John Tosto of Flint, Michigan. He rents planes out of the Greater Flint Pilots Association and also co-owns a Cherokee 6 that's just been updated with a Garmin G3X panel and the GTN 650 GPS navigators. Vic Bajaj, who lives here in the San Francisco Bay Area and flies a Cirrus. Rick Love, he's a Knoxville, Tennessee-based Cirrus CSIP, former factory instructor, specializes in finish-up courses for instrument and commercial ratings, and also available for Cirrus transition training and recurrent training and ferry flights. 
You can find him at ricklovecfi at gmail.com. Mark Holzbach, he lives in southwestern PA, is a longtime aviation enthusiast who wants to get his private when he retires. He runs bodensteel.com, which manufactures industrial fasteners. Tim Crawford, he's flying a DA-40 at Crosswinds Aviation at the Oakland County Airport north of Detroit. He runs a company called Brainspring that helps kids with dyslexia. And Greg Van and James Kerr, who we just talked about. And I really want to thank all of you for your contributions and thank everyone who helps support the show in any way. Now in a moment, we're going to talk about some IFR gotchas right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. And now let's talk about some IFR gotchas. All of these were experienced over the last week or so. This first one might change the way you choose to file an IFR flight plan. It happened near the end of my five days of flying around the western U.S. teaching in a vision jet. We were happy to be landing back at the home base of Watsonville Airport, which is on the coast south of San Francisco. However, the Pacific Ocean is cold and it often has a lower level of clouds that sometimes move in over coastal airports at night and then burns off in the morning. Well, we arrived about 5 p.m. and the low-level clouds had already started to cover the airport. So we flew the RNAV GPS Runway 2 approach. It has the lowest minimums at the airport, which are 448 feet, which is 296 feet AGL. We flew the approach, but at minimums, couldn't see a thing, and we had to go mist. So we diverted to Salinas, 19 miles to the southeast, and landed there in VFR conditions. Then we took an Uber back to Watsonville, and during the drive, the clouds were often down to the road, so it was a particularly bad night. A couple of hours later, I got a message from NorCal asking if I knew the pilot of a Cirrus aircraft that had landed IFR at Salinas after us, but hadn't closed its IFR flight plan. The reason they called me is that some of the people there know I'm a very active Cirrus pilot, and one of the people on duty just happened to know I'd been at the Salinas airport. So they wondered if I was still at Salinas and could look for the aircraft, or if I had a way to get in touch with a pilot. This was around 9 p.m. after the tower had closed, and at that point, NorCal had been searching for the plane and pilot for over an hour. I was here at home, and I started Googling the tail number, but only found a corporation name and couldn't figure out the name of the pilot. So I contacted someone at Cirrus who I thought might know, and even though it was late, he got right back to me with a name but no contact information. I then found a website for the person, which gave me a phone number and an email address, About this time, I heard from NorCal that they had sent the police out to the airport. They had searched the ramp and found the aircraft, but nobody with the airplane. So at least now they knew the aircraft hadn't crashed, which is, of course, the biggest concern when a pilot forgets to cancel their IFR flight plan. I tried the phone number I found on the website for the pilot and left a voicemail. Then I sent an email with the subject in all caps, NEED TO CANCEL YOUR IFR SALINAS. And the email said, just left you a voicemail. I'm a vision jet pilot who landed at Salinas an hour or two before you this evening. NorCal contacted me to see if I knew you as they never received an IFR cancellation from you. I left you voicemail. Subsequently have heard back from NorCal that the police who were called out located your aircraft safely on the ground. You'll probably still want to call NorCal. Phone number is blah, blah, blah. Moments later, NorCal let me know that they had heard from the pilot. And you might think that's the end of the story, but there were a few twists, one of which may change how you file your IFR flight plans in the future. When the pilot called, he was given what's called a brasher warning, which advises a pilot of a possible pilot deviation. And of course, that means most likely he's going to have to talk with an FAA inspector in the future about what happened. If you're wondering, wow, what's the big deal? Why violate a pilot over forgetting to close a flight plan? Here's what the big deal is. At least this is how it works in Northern California. The first concern, of course, is that you might have crashed. And if it's at a non-towered airport or airport where the tower is closed and there are no airport operations people on duty, it's not going to be easy for approach control to determine if you landed safely. They may have to do what NorCal did in this case, which is to call the police or the sheriff to search the airport for your tail number. Uh, The TRACON will also be phoning around to other neighboring airports to see if you diverted to one of those. But it's also possible that you're still in the air and that you're circling around trying to get into the airport or are diverting to another nearby airport. And in many areas, radar coverage does not go all the way down to the ground, so the TRACON or center can't see you after you descend below a particular altitude. So it's not safe for ATC to send other IFR aircraft into the airport after you. 
When you fail to close an IFR flight plan, ATC essentially sanitizes the airport, meaning that the airport is now closed to all IFR traffic. No planes in, no planes out. At NorCal, they'll do that for the first half hour after a pilot fails to cancel IFR. And then for the next half hour, they'll notify other aircraft of the situation and let those pilots choose whether to proceed inbound to land on an approach or to depart the airport on an IFR clearance. And think about the worst possible case, which is that the first aircraft crashed, not near the airport, but on the runway. And then more than a half hour later, another aircraft decides to fly the approach, lands on the runway, and hits the wreckage of the first aircraft. Now, that's unlikely to happen in daytime in low visibility, but imagine you're landing at Salinas at night when the field is overcast at 300 feet as it was when we were trying to contact this pilot. Now, the second aircraft then is at significant risk if there's wreckage on the runway. About a half hour after a pilot fails to cancel IFR, the stakes are raised. Now, this comes from the controller handbook, uh, section 10-3-1. A, consider an aircraft to be overdue and initiate the procedures stated in this section to issue an all not that's A-L-N-O-T, which stands for alert notice, when neither communications nor radar contact can be established and 30 minutes have passed since one, it's ETA over a specified or compulsory reporting point or at a clearance limit in your area. Two, it's clearance void time. Three, a VFR or IFR aircraft arriving at an airport not served by an ATC tower or flight service station fails to cancel a flight plan after receiving instructions on how to cancel. And it says here, there's a note, if you have reason to believe that an aircraft is overdue prior to 30 minutes, take the appropriate action immediately. And that continues on here, B, consider an aircraft to be in an emergency status and initiate all not procedures in this section immediately when there is an abnormal simultaneous loss of radar and communications with an IFR aircraft or VFR SVFR aircraft receiving flight following services. This situation may be applicable to an aircraft operating in a non-radar environment and an unexpected abnormal loss of communication occurs. C, the ARTC, which would be center, the ARTC in whose area the aircraft is reported as overdue, missing, or lost will make these determinations and take any subsequent action required. D, if you have a reason to believe that an aircraft is overdue prior to 30 minutes, take the appropriate action immediately. And E, the center in whose area the aircraft is first unreported or overdue will make these determinations and make any subsequent action required. And then there's a whole lot more detail in the controller handbook about what happens what information has to be provided to center, which in this case would be Oakland Center. The center is then responsible for a lot of notifications in the beginning of search and rescue. So once a half hour goes by, a lot of people become involved and there's a lot of unnecessary work generated, all because a pilot forgot to close an IFR flight plan. In this case, I heard that if the pilot had called within the first 30 minutes, that would have been the end of it. But he didn't call for over an hour and a half after he landed, And that's why he was advised of a possible pilot deviation. By the way, the pilot said in one email to me that he was seriously annoyed with himself for letting this happen, which is the right attitude, as we should all strive to follow all of the FARs all of the time. He later wrote that, This is the first time I've ever been required to cancel on the ground. I've either flown into a towered airport or have been able to cancel during the approach. So we tend to remember the things that we do all the time, and it's much harder to remember rules about situations we've never encountered before. Though I have no doubt that the last thing NorCal said was advise canceling IFR or on the ground, as that's the last thing they always tell me when I'm flying into a non-towered airport. But there's one more twist to the story, and it probably affects you and how you file your IFR flight plans. One of the people I contacted while trying to figure out who the pilot was said they were surprised the pilot didn't include his contact information in the IFR flight plan. And the next day when I followed up with the pilot, he wrote something that intrigued me. He wrote, I'm just not sure why they didn't call my cell phone or email me. I filed with both. Well, I looked at the flight plan section of the ForeFlight app, and sure enough, at the bottom, it showed my contact information. But I wondered, does that information make it all the way to the controllers working in flight? because I can see how pilots might assume that since everything else on the page is flight plan related, that the contact information shown is also transmitted to the FAA. So I decided to do a test. I emailed NorCal and told them about a flight I had coming up that day in a vision jet from Watsonville to the Grand Canyon Airport in Arizona, and I asked them to look at the strip when they received it to see if it contained my name and phone information. 
When I landed at GCN, I had an email from NorCal that they had checked the flight plan, checked with Oakland Center, checked with another group, and none of them had my contact information. I was also copied on an email from NorCal to ForeFlight, which produced some interesting information. Apparently, in the past, ForeFlight used to drop the phone number into the remarks section, and both pilots and controllers got upset. Now, the pilots were upset for privacy reasons, and the controllers for what they thought was garbage using up space in the remarks section. So, essentially, ForeFlight is caught in the middle and really could use the FAA to make some recommendations and set a standard as to what happens with that contact information. So here's what you may want to do in the future when you file an IFR flight plan. At a minimum, I suggest that you put your phone number in the remarks section. That way, if you forget to close your flight plan after flying into a non-towered airport or into a towered airport after the tower closes, the FAA can easily find your phone number and then call you to verify that you've landed safely. This is a simple way that might help you avoid getting a pilot deviation if you forget to close an IFR flight plan. And here's a simple trick a pilot told me he uses to remember to cancel a flight plan. He said he always keeps his watch on his left arm, but he moves it to his right arm when he's either filling a swimming pool or when he has an IFR flight plan that he needs to remember to cancel. And if you've ever moved your watch to a different arm, you'll notice when you start walking around that something feels different. And that's a good reminder to close your flight plan after you climb out of the plane and start walking around. And here's an entirely different IFR gotcha. A few nights ago, while teaching IFR in actual conditions, I invoked my rule of two. And if you're unfamiliar with the rule of two for flying, well, that's because I made it up. Actually, there are multiple versions of it, one of which I learned while teaching a safety seminar. My personal version is that when I get to the second factor, which is not quite right, I scrub a potential flight or terminate an uh, actual flight. Generally, accidents are caused by a series of bad decisions, so by stopping at the second factor that's not quite right, I'm trying to break a link in the chain and avoid having an accident. While talking about this at a safety seminar I was teaching, a pilot in the audience described his own version of the rule of two. For him, it means that he never attempts a flight with two risk factors. For example, he will fly over the mountains, but not at night or when IFR, or if he flies IFR, he won't do it at night. Now, I wrote an article a while back for FAA Aviation News, and I mentioned that there's a great disparity between the commercial and the GA accident rates, which is partially explained by the airline's use of two pilot crews. And over the years, I've noticed that when I fly with two pilots, I am less fatigued when I arrive. And I attribute that to one, lower stress of sharing the workload with another pilot, but two, knowing that there's a second pilot to alert me to mistakes I might make. And when taking a long trip or when needing to fly after a long day of business, you might consider taking a second pilot, perhaps a CFI, along with you. So all of these are different versions of my rule of two. Now, in this particular case of the rule of two, I was teaching IFR in an older Avidyne SR-22 that had been upgraded with a pair of GTN 650 GPS navigators and an Avidyne DFC-90 autopilot. We had just flown a GPS approach into San Luis Obispo at night, and the DFC-90 autopilot didn't couple to the glide path, so I had the pilot disconnect the autopilot and hand-fly the approach. Next, we flew the ILS-10 right into Monterey, and again, the DFC autopilot didn't couple to the approach, so again, I had the pilot disconnect and hand-fly the approach. Well, shortly after that, we entered really thick clouds, and our strobe lights began harshly reflecting off the clouds, nearly blinding us in the cockpit. And about that time, I noticed that our airspeed had decayed to 82 knots, whereas we fly approaches in the Cirrus at 100 knots. So I immediately called for a go-around, even though we had just barely started the approach. So yes, we could have turned off the strobe lights, but we had all of the cockpit lighting turned down very low so that our eyes would adapt to the darkness and help us see better outside. And when I looked toward the strobe switch, I couldn't see it or any of the other switches next to it. So rather than have the pilot fumble for the strobe switch in the darkness and possibly let his airspeed decay even further, I called for a missed approach and we quickly climbed back up out of the clouds. So in this case, you could argue that I didn't react until three things occurred. The autopilot failing to couple to the glide slope, the blinding strobes, and the very slow airspeed. But it was really the blinding strobes that were the issue. In just a few seconds, I found them to be painful very distracting, and I can only imagine for some pilots that could eventually induce a seizure. But what kicked off the entire sequence of events was the DFC-90 autopilot not coupling to the glide slope. If it had, we wouldn't have been slow, and our hands would have been free to hunt for the strobe switch, so I resolved to figure out 
what it was about the autopilot that we didn't know. Now, the Avidyne DFC-90 was designed as a drop-in replacement for the older STEC 55X that originally shipped with most older Avidyne Cirrus aircraft. And the STEC 55X was a great autopilot for its time, but that design is now well over 20 years old, and the DFC-90 is a popular digital replacement autopilot for these older aircraft. I've used the DFC-90 autopilot a number of times, but not on a lot of instrument approaches. So afterwards, I went through the manual in detail to try and figure out the issue. And after researching, I came up with one more clue to the crash of an SR-22 in August that we talked about in detail in episode 162. You might recall in that accident, there were many risk factors, including a pilot who had relatively low total flying time, little experience in the SR-22, and was flying in the wee hours of the morning. And after a five-hour flight, he flew past his destination to buy cheap fuel at another airport close to his home. And during that time, his home field went below minimums. But he appeared to be unaware on the final approach that he was flying parallel, but offset by 0.6 miles laterally from the entire instrument approach. And he ended up crashing a mile short of the runway. And the pilot had made a similar mistake during an instrument approach he flew two nights before, which led me to conclude that he was using his moving map for primary guidance which is a big no-no because depending upon the map range you've set, it may appear from the map that you're on course when you're actually flying parallel to the course. Instead, always, always, always use your CDI or HSI for primary course guidance and only use the moving map for supplemental guidance. Well, when I reread the manual for the DFC-90, I found that it was confusing, especially with regard to the NAV and GPSS buttons. And apparently the behavior of these buttons varies depending upon which GPS navigator you're using it with. And I'm guessing the pilot who crashed in the SR-22 was unaware of the differences between these two buttons. Here's what I discovered. In the DFC-90, the use of nav and GPS buttons are generally identical, meaning you could use either one if you want the autopilot to follow a navigation source. However, when flying an ILS approach or a GPS approach with a glide path, the glide slope or glide path modes are only armed if the nav button is used. If the GPSS button was pushed, the glide slope or glide path modes won't arm and the DFC-90 won't couple to a glide slope or glide path. And that may help explain the August accident as it's obvious from the high descent rate the pilot had on this fatal approach that he was not coupled to the glide path. So I can't help but wonder if he used the GPSS button instead of the nav button. Now, there is one problem I've seen with the DFC-90 manual. It says, quote, approaches with curved paths must use GPSS. Certain GPS approaches involving curved paths cannot be flown in nav mode. Example, holds, DME arcs, etc. GPSS mode must be used for those procedures. Well, we have subsequently discovered that is not true in my client's aircraft using the GTN-650 with the DFC-90. We were able to use nav mode for curved paths and ultimately discovered that we should always use nav mode and never use GPSS mode as we wouldn't be able to couple the glide slopes and paths. I also found an Avidyne online forum that discusses the use of the nav and GPSS buttons. One of the people posting wrote that the section of the manual I quoted a moment ago is incorrect, which was also our experience in my client's aircraft. He wrote, if you fly an ILS with a DME arc with a DFC-90 in GPSS mode, the ILS portion of the approach will not arm. And I would take that even further and say that, in our experience, the glide slope never arms when using GPSS, regardless of the type of leg used on an ILS. So, as you've probably figured out, the reason we had trouble coupling the glide slope was my client was pushing the GPSS button. Subsequently, any time he used the nav button instead, he was always able to couple to the glide slopes and glide paths. Now, there is one corner case I'm aware of where you might want to use the GPSS button in combination with a Garmin GTN 650 or 750, and that's when flying a VOR approach. You're now permitted to fly an entire VOR approach using your GPS for primary guidance, provided you're monitoring the underlying VOR signal. So in an Avidyne-equipped SR-20 or SR-22, which would have been built before about 2008 or 2009, you could select the VOR needle for display on the HSI, but use the DFC-90 autopilot to track the overlying GPS course, which is probably what I would do. And you would do that by using the GPSS mode. 
By the way, everything I've said here only applies to using the DFC90 with the GTN650. Please don't generalize what I've said to other combinations using the DFC90 with, for example, the Garmin GNS430, as I haven't thoroughly tested other combinations, and the behavior might be different from what I've seen with the GTN650. And by the way, I think the DFC90 is a great autopilot, so please don't construe anything I'm saying here uh, to say that there's anything wrong with the, uh, the autopilot. I think it really is great. But the moral of the story here is to know in great detail how the avionics in your specific aircraft work, because there are many different combinations of avionics found in aircraft, and some equipment works differently depending upon what it's connected to. And of course, remember the rule of two. Anytime you hit that second issue that's not quite right, don't take off, go missed or land early, depending upon the phase of flight you're in when the second issue occurs. You don't want to encounter a third issue that might possibly lead to an accident. And finally, here's one more gotcha, and that has to do with flying to IAFs in an RNAV-equipped aircraft. I was surprised recently to learn that if you're in an RNAV, such as a GPS-equipped aircraft, that it's more restrictive when you start at an IAF for an instrument approach, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me, but let me tell you how that came about. As you probably know, you can usually approach an IAF, the initial approach fix, from any direction. And once you reach the IAF, you can turn directly onto the initial segment, regardless of how big a turn is involved. And that's the way instrument flying has been done for the 30 plus years that I've had an instrument rating. The exception is if the IAF is combined with another fix, such as the IF, the intermediate fix, or even the FAF, the final approach fix. In those cases, you'll see it written as an IAF slash IF, and often there's a hold depicted there. In these cases, you either have to do a course reversal in the hold, or you're allowed to proceed directly inbound if you arrive at the IAF slash IF from a course that allows you to turn inbound with a turn of less than 90 degrees. You can also start at the IF of any approach, provided the turn onto the approach is less than 90 degrees. So here's what happened. I was giving instrument instruction in a Cirrus SR-20, and we asked to fly the RNAV GPS Zulu 3-1 approach into Salinas, California. We asked to get cleared directly to FGON, that's E-F-G-O-N, which is an IAF for the approach. And by the way, there is no hold depicted at FGON, and it's not combined with the IF or the final approach fix, which are separate fixes further down the approach. So it's a clean IAF, which you should be able to approach from any direction. When I asked to be cleared direct to FGON, I was told that I would first have to be vectored to a point where the turn to this IAF would be less than 90 degrees. I replied that was the case for starting an approach at an IF or intermediate fix, but this was an IAF. The controller replied that this applied to an IAF. Now, at the time, I was sure the controller was wrong, but did discuss it any further, as it just wasn't worth arguing about it on the radio. In this case, getting vectored would only take a few extra seconds, so from a practical standpoint, it didn't matter. After we landed, I did some research and discovered that there's a big discrepancy about this point between the 7110.615, which is the FAA's controller handbook, and every other piece of documentation I could find from the FAA on the subject. So, frankly, I think that whomever wrote this section of the controller handbook misinterpreted the rules, though I think I know why they may have been confused. Here's what the controller handbook says. This comes from section 4-8-1, approach clearance. Under section D, it says, for RNAV-equipped aircraft, so planes flying with GPSs, Operating on unpublished routes, issue approach clearances for conventional, which means any type of instrument approach, or RNAV SIAPs, which would be GPS standard instrument approach procedures, only after the aircraft is, one, established on a heading or course direct to the IAF at an intercept angle not greater than 90 degrees, and is assigned an altitude in accordance with B2, Radar monitoring is required for RNAV RNP approaches when no procedure turn or hold in lieu of procedure turn will be executed. Two, established on a heading or course direct to the IF at an angle not greater than 90 degrees, provided the following conditions are met. A, assign an altitude in accordance with B2, that's a different section, that will permit a normal descent to the FAF. Note, controllers should expect aircraft to descend at approximately 150 to 300 feet per nautical mile when applying guidance in subparagraph D2A. B, radar monitoring is provided to the IF. C, the SIAP must identify the intermediate fix with the letters IF. 
D for procedures where an IF is published, the pilot is advised to expect clearance to the IF at least five miles from the fix. All right, so that's what it says in the controller handbook. Let's look at some other FAA sources that contradict this. Let's start with the AIM, the Aeronautical Information Manual. Section 5-4-6, Approach Clearance. E1, maintain the last altitude assigned by ATC until the aircraft is established on a published segment or transition route or approach procedure segment or other published route for which a lower altitude is published on the chart. If already on an established route or approach or arrival segment, you may descend to whatever minimum altitude is listed for that route or segment. Two, continue on the vector heading until intercepting the next published ground track applicable to the approach clearance. Three, once reaching the final approach fix via the published segments, the pilot may continue on approach to a landing. Four, if proceeding to an IAF with a published course reversal, except when cleared for a straight on approach by ATC, the pilot must execute the procedure turn or hold in lieu of procedure turn and complete the approach. Five, if cleared to, and this is critical, an IAF slash IF via a no procedure turn route, uh, or no procedure turn hold in lieu of procedure turn is published, continue with a published approach. Six, in addition to the above, RNAF aircraft may be issued a clearance directly to the IAF slash IF. By the way, that doesn't say to the IAF. Direct to the IAF slash IF at intercept angles not greater than 90 degrees for both conventional and RNAV instrument approaches. And then further down it says, when clearing aircraft direct to the IF, ATC will monitor the aircraft until the IF and advise the pilot to expect clearance direct to the IF at least five miles from the fix. ATC must issue a straight and approach clearance when clearing an aircraft direct to an IAF slash IF with a procedure turn or hold in lieu of procedure turn and ATC does not want the aircraft to execute the course reversal. So essentially what this is saying is that 90 degree turn is required if you have an IF or if you start at an IAF slash IF. Nowhere in the AIM does it say that if you're at an IAF that you require a 90 degree turn. Now, if you go to the FAA's Instrument Procedures Handbook, page 4-49, it says essentially the same thing. There are no references anywhere to making a turn less than 90 degrees at the IAF, except in the controller handbook. <laughs> now, how could this happen? Frankly, my guess is that when people were writing this section of the controller handbook, they misinterpreted the meaning of IAF slash IF. The correct meaning of that is a fix which serves as both an IAF and an IF. But one could misinterpret IAF slash IF to mean that the following applies to IAFs and IFs. And if that's how you interpret it, you would come up with this additional requirement, now found in the controller handbook, to limit turns at the IAF to no more than 90 degrees, but only for RNAV equipped aircraft, which makes absolutely no sense at all. So if anyone from the FAA is listening, you might want to resolve this discrepancy. Coming up next, Listener questions are right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. Now let's go to listener questions. This one is about how to get the IFR route that you want. Comes from Patreon supporter Russ Irwin. He says, yesterday I flew from my home airport, Petaluma, to Watsonville. It was very smoky with marginal VFR visibility, but lots of VFR planes were flying. There were enough airplanes in the air without ADSB that I wanted to file IFR so that ATC would keep an eye on the primary targets that I couldn't see. No matter what I filed or how far east I tried to force the route, including entirely east of the Class Bravo, the ATC computer kept giving me PYE Victor 27 Showy. This is a route which is a good 10 to 15 miles offshore over the ocean. I'm in a piston single. I don't like flying 10 to 15 nautical miles offshore. I filed for T257, which would be a GPST route, which is mostly along the coast and got the same PYE Victor 27 showy route. I even filed T257 at 11,000 feet over the top of the Bravo and still got the same route. I considered the following options, and you might want to think as you're listening here to which option you would choose. He said, option A was call from the ground and try to negotiate a better route with center. 
B, pick up the expected route in the air and try to negotiate a better route in the air. He said that's problematic because my departure is about 7 to 10 minutes away from entering the Bravo. Not much time with the busy center controller handling commercial flights into SFO. Or C, pick a more easterly location which would force the route to the east, then divert in the air. He said I pick C and file to Echo 16, which is the San Martin Airport, and my clearance was SGD Sinal and picked it up in the air. ATC ignored the clearance and sent me on vectors out toward Tracy, and then I diverted to Watsonville. They asked why I diverted, and I said the weather had improved. This wasn't optimal, but it kept me over land. It all worked out, and I got a reroute in the air to Watsonville, but it seemed like it was too difficult for everyone involved. A busy NorCal controller basically had to give me a pop-up clearance. I had to do something similar on the return, but I'll spare you the details. So what's a pilot to do when the ATC computer insists on a route which is unacceptable? And when I got that email from Russ, I wasn't really able to sort out which of those options would be the best. So I contacted NorCal Approach. There I was referred to Jason Bush, who's an operations supervisor at NorCal. He replied, I like A in this case. And by the way, just to review, A is call from the ground and try to negotiate a better route with center. He said, we get this pretty often departing Watsonville, Monterey, Salinas for points northwest of San Francisco. The problem is that the ERAM computer is programmed to modify certain routes. Once it sees certain fixed pairs, the pilot can do little to keep the computer from amending his or her original route. This is also done before ATC sees the flight strip. The strip will, however, show ATC the original route right along with the amended route. It may be a little more work ahead of time, but if a pilot gets a human in the loop before departure, it can usually be quickly resolved. Once ATC is aware the amended route is bad for that flight, they can do a couple of things. Send a command that suppresses the preferential routing and let the pilot fly as filed, or amend the flight plan outright. B is my least favorite of these options, which just to review was pick up the expected route in the air and try to negotiate a better route in the air. I continue on, he says, correcting a route takes some attention off the scope. If you call airborne, you have no idea if the controller will be in a good position to correct a route. If you're calling before departure, however, you're typically dealing with someone who isn't working at a radar scope. In NorCal's case, that could be a flight data specialist a CIC, which is a controller in charge, or an operations supervisor who can amend the route. If you're working with a ground controller or clearance delivery, they're usually on the line with the before-mentioned people working the problem. If you're calling via phone from a smaller airport, you're typically talking to these people directly. It's best to call the TRACON or center directly rather than go through flight service, at least in Northern California, so be familiar with those clearance delivery phone numbers. He finishes up and he says, C has some problems too. We are required to ask for a reason when an IFR aircraft changes their destination. If we deem those reasons suspicious, more action may be required. Well, there you go, Russ. Great answer to your question. Russ, by the way, is a Patreon supporter. Here's another question from another Patreon supporter, Joseph Smith Stewart. He says, hi, Max. Wanted to run a question by you. And then he describes a flight that he took uh, to do some practice and some landings. And then on the return, he was coming through the Class Charlie, and he got terminated when he was in the Class Charlie still. And here's what he says. Shortly after I announced that I was near downtown, he terminated flight following Squawk VFR frequency change approved. At this point, I was still at 2,500 feet within the Class C outer shelf, but no longer in communication with NorCal Approach. I immediately started a descent to get below the Class Charlie shelf to 1,400 feet. I then contacted the McClellan Tower to let them know I was inbound for landing. They said no traffic in the area and to contact uh, the L-36, which is another airport, CTAF for landing, which I acknowledged and switched over. Question, did I need to get below the Class C shelf immediately to remain legal when the controller terminated flight following while I was still in the Class Charlie? And again, this was one where I thought, hmm, you know, I think you're probably fine, but I wanted to, uh, you know, get an answer. Uh, so I shot a note off uh, again to this time to NorCal, and someone replied, I wouldn't fly any differently if terminated prior to exiting the Charlie. If I was going to naturally exit, then re-enter, however, I'd be sure not to re-enter the Charlie. So as I looked at the chart on this one, it appears to me the controller just wanted to give the aircraft time to check in on the CTAF which pretty much fit with what I was thinking. If you're in the Charlie 
and you're headed to an airport and the controller terminates you so you can contact that airport, you're probably perfectly fine to be in the Charlie and not talking with them any longer. And here's some listener feedback that just came in regarding episode 165, which was about helicopter certification. Hi, Max. My name is Jay. This is response to episode 165. I agree with 95% of what Steve was saying about the uh, U.S. helicopter industry, but I think it was only accurate pre-COVID. What I think Steve didn't mention was the huge effects of COVID-19 on uh, those first-tier jobs. For example, the massive reduction in demand in the helicopter tour business. Uh, For example, Sundance in Las Vegas, which is one of the largest helicopter tour companies in the U.S., has just gone out of business. Also, the Gulf of Mexico oil support business has been heavily hit as demand for oil has been reduced by the reduction in the economy and also green alternatives becoming more affordable. So with those initial turbine time jobs, not much of an option right now. Of course, that flows down to the step before, which is the flight school instructors. They can't move on and they're not leaving the flight schools, which means hiring of instructors is down. And the flight schools are not flying so much anyway with the effects of COVID, which obviously affects the demand for new instructors. On top of uh, that, the current airline furloughs and permanent layoffs like Express Jet and Transtate going out of business will mean, I think as Steve mentioned, that some of those helicopter pilots that have taken advantage of the rotor transition programs are now going back to helicopters, increasing the pilot pool for those few jobs that are there. So although there are still helicopter jobs out there, especially air ambulance and firework, I think it may be some time before the demand for those jobs at the bottom of the food chain, instructors, tour pilots on oil and gas really picks up. I hope I'm wrong. Jay, thanks so much for your feedback. And Jay used our SpeakPipe app, which I mentioned before. If you have anything you'd like to send to the show, whether it's feedback, a listener question, or especially if you'd like to record a fun flying destination, that's an easy way to do it. Just do what Jay did. Go to aviationnewstalk.com, click on listener question at the top, and you'll have 90 seconds to record. And just a quick reminder, this is a listener-supported show. We've got two easy ways that you can donate. One is go to aviationnewstalk.com slash PayPal. The other, aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome. In the former case, you can make either a one-time donation or a monthly donation. In the latter case, aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome takes you to Patreon, where you can make a monthly donation and where you get all kinds of goodies at the different support levels. And of course, everyone who donates gets their name read on the show, regardless of what level you might sign up at. And finally, please tell all of your friends about the Aviation News Talk podcast. And if they don't know what a podcast is, send them out to the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store for Android, where they can download our dedicated app for free. Just search in either store for Aviation News Talk. So until next time, fly safely, have fun, and keep the blue side up.